Hello, hello, I'm Jim Barry, and this is Miami Life, a show that talks to the interesting people and tackles the hot topics in South Florida. If folks in Miami-Dade and Broward are talking about it, so will we. Well, so many of us were impacted by the insane amount of rain we had over a few days about a week ago. Some neighborhoods saw their streets turn into rivers. Some homes got flooded. Some folks had to be rescued. The governor declared a state of emergency and a hundred temporary pumps were needed to get millions of gallons of water from the area. South Florida was absolutely inundated. And for some communities, the cleanup was painfully slow, particularly in parts of Northeast Miami-Dade and also in Broward County. That's where our Joan Murray talked to residents and business owners about the struggles they now face. Ken Schleesman held his breath as flood water piled up outside his car repair shop off West Sterling Road in Dania Beach last week. 14 months ago in the devastating April 2023 flood, he was shut down three weeks. The problem, this drainage lake keeps overflowing, affecting his shop and a hundred others in this business park. Last year it's done it, you know, in, in April. That was un unheard of. And it's done it again. Now it seems to get done very easily. North in Fort Lauderdale, it's been a slow, steady drain. A lot of the water has receded, but a lot of neighborhoods are still drying out. So we cleaned everything up, but there is one spot where you can see where the water was. Tony Schreiber lives in Edgewood, another neighborhood destroyed in the April 2023 flood. This time, he said the water was about a foot on his outside wall. Oh, uh, you know, maybe an inch or two, but any any water in the house is bad news. Bad news for a lot of South Florida drivers whose cars are now totaled. Once flood water damages electronics, oftentimes it cannot be repaired. You see the water? Marie St. Hilaire said flood water was up to her waist in her backyard. Inside her home, everything is in disarray. She says water was above her baseboards, but she said she has insurance. Many families do not and will have to figure out a way to deal with the damage. Ken Schleisman, in business over 30 years, is worried what's ahead this hurricane season. It's the beginning of the summer, and we're off to a rough, rough start. All right, that was uh, our Joan Murray report. We're going to take a deeper dive into the whole cleanup process, which for some obviously will not be easy. With us now is Carlos Martorell. He's a licensed insurance adjuster from Leading Public Adjusters. Carlos, thanks for coming in. I know it's your job to help people navigate through this. I'm sure a lot of people now have claims uh, because of all the flooding. What's the difference between uh, a flood damage and water damage? Thank you for having me, Jim. Well, so water damage is something that you're gonna have in your property because of a plumbing issue, for instance, perhaps a roof leak, or anything that happens on the interior of the property. Mm. Now, flood, the difference is when, when you have standing water that comes in from outside of the property into your house, that would then trigger a flood claim. And your regular homeowner's insurance is not gonna cover that. You gotta have flood insurance for that. That is correct, and that's a big misconception that people have. They they see the regular homeowner's policy, they, they read water damage, and they automatically think, yeah. my flood's covered, and that's not true. Wow, all right, so let's say you get the water out of your house, uh, you think you're good to go, but the damage is still there. Mold can be a very quiet thing, insidious thing that you don't realize it can spread. Is that covered by flood insurance? Flood insurance, unfortunately, does not offer mold coverage. So that's something that a homeowner needs to know. Immediately, as soon as you see any signs of mold, any, you know, obviously when you have water inside your house and the humidity, you know, all you're probably going to have it. You're going to have mold. Yeah. So you need to act quickly because mold will spread very quickly. You need to get an expert out there to get it tested, sent out to a lab, and get it treated as quickly as possible huh. because, again, that is not covered by your flood policy. So what does flood insurance cover? So flood insurance covers any structural issues with the property that are due to the flood. So mm -hmm. it's very important for you as a homeowner to, as soon as you detect water coming into your property, from that standing water outside, take lots of pictures, take videos, make sure that that line that that water is going to leave on that on those walls, baseboards, or mm -hmm. in the exterior of the property, mm -hmm. do not erase them because that's very important. That's your evidence that you're going to have once you present the claim to the insurance and company. And we're looking at some of the things that cover, like you said, the physical structure of the home, water heaters, appliances, cabinets and paneling, and so on. Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Unfortunately, items in the exterior of the house are not covered either. So, for instance, your fence is not covered, sheds oh. are not covered. You know, so we, we have to make sure we act quickly, which is the most important thing when it comes to a flood. Other than taking those pictures, what else do you need to do to prepare your claim? Well, obviously take, take the pictures, take videos, make sure you have that policy handy, 
act quickly. But make sure if you're hiring a, a licensed public adjuster, have them call the insurance company as quickly as possible. And if you're not, same thing. You make sure that you as a homeowner call that insurance company as quickly as possible. It seems as though with uh, what we're seeing now, this extreme rain and so uh, buckets of rain coming quickly, uh, you're going to get a lot more claims and we're going to be dealing with this. So what should a homeowner do to try to prepare for a situation like this? Or really, is there anything that you can do? Well, there's not a whole lot you can do. Unfortunately, Mother Nature, you know, makes their calls, but you should call your, your agent, reach out to them, make sure that you have the proper coverage. Uh, again, a lot of people don't have flood insurance. They think that because they have water damage coverage on yeah. their homeowner's policy, that that would be covered. They don't know that they could encounter hundreds of thousands of dollars in damage if a flood does get into your property. What kind of calls have you been getting? We've been getting a ton of calls, especially from the North Miami area. You know, they've had two, three feet of water inside their house. I mean, it, it's it's pretty bad. Hmm. Um, and unfortunately, it's something that, you know, the insurance companies are, are trying to get out there as, as quickly as possible and helping the homeowners. But they, they do need, need to act, especially when it comes to mold. You know, uh, we were having a discussion off camera real quick, and I heard uh, another discussion uh, that said maybe FEMA should broaden the whole definition of what it's disaster claim coverage should be sure. and I'm wondering uh, if in fact FEMA did that would that take some of the heat off of insurance companies that's a possibility I mean right now FEMA is most of the policies here in South Florida so most of the policies most of the flood policies here in South Florida are through the NFIP program mm -hmm. which is FEMA so if it does broaden their scope it's a possibility that that will help us and, and as we all know I mean homeowners insurance is rising and mm -hmm. it's getting more and more expensive for all of us and harder to get harder to get too I mean you know the older your property is or perhaps you don't have impact windows or your roof hasn't been replaced in a while it's harder to get insurance yeah it is but uh, we got to have it because of where we live absolutely right. you need to have it here yeah Carlos thanks for your time man. Appreciate I appreciate you. it thank you Jim all right Carlos Martorell thank you so much all righty as we move on of course there was another issue that some folks had to deal with here in South Florida we're talking about that apartment fire in downtown Miami and the folks who live there now face an uncertain future after that devastating fire in fact demolition has begun at the Temple Court apartment complex after the burned out property was deemed a huge safety risk. And all this happened so fast, folks who lived there were not allowed back in to collect any of their belongings. CBS News Miami's Terry Hornstein has their story. Demolition underway Tuesday at the Temple Court Apartments after a fire ripped through the complex last Monday. The residents have already been informed that they are not going back inside. It is considered unsafe because of a partial collapse inside and the hazardous materials contained within. Those residents devastated. I lost family photos. I lost pretty much all my belongings. The fire quickly turned to a crime scene when Miami police said they found a maintenance worker, Fede Biot, shot in the building. His godfather sent us these pictures and added he's still intubated and cannot speak. The suspect, 73-year-old Juan Figueroa, is facing attempted murder and arson charges. He's being held without bond. The fire displaced more than 40 residents, those residents now living temporarily at a Motel 6 in Doral. One of them, Francisco Morado, drove back to the Temple Court Apartments in Miami, begging police to let him inside to grab his important documents. Pasaporte, Medicare, Medicaid, eh, Social Security, eh, todo lo papeles. But city officials say the building is structurally unsound with the roof and top floors sitting on the bottom floors. And with the recent heavy rains, they say the walls could come crashing down at any moment. I've been approached today and, and they understand. They just need those words of comfort. And I think that the only thing I can tell them is that they're alive and that's what actually matters. Amen to that. That was Terry Hornstein reporting. Up next on Miami Life, thanks largely to the Florida Panthers, hockey is red hot in South Florida. We've got the story of how one local high school is dropping the puck with the help of the Panthers. Plus this. What's your favorite part about the experience? Um, kicking the ball to, to the goal. Oh yeah, the incredible career of Lionel Messi comes to life in an immersive new exhibit that lets fans walk in the soccer greats' footsteps. We're going to take you there, Coconut Grove, when we come back. Well, the Florida Panthers' incredible season has been a huge boost to local youth hockey. Look no further than the Florida Panthers' Scholastic League. It's made up mostly of Broward teams, but there is one Miami-Dade school looking to get in on the fun. Here's Mike Cuno. 
Spurs are three. One, two, three, Spurs. At the Panthers Ice Den in Coral Springs is a team from the 305, Christopher Columbus High School, a powerhouse sports program that's now dipping its toe into the frozen pond. The strong side on the board, do the guy in the middle. Head coach Gus Diaz helped start this club team that now plays in the Florida Panthers Scholastic League, a league for high school teams in Dayton Broward. There's 14 natural teams for high schools in Broward. Yeah. Until we came along, there was only one in Dade County, and it's an alliance. In other words, it's a team of orphans. Yeah. No other high school in Dade County has its own team except Columbus, and we're still a club. But Pinocchio wants to be a real boy, right? For Coach Diaz, going from Pinocchio to a real boy means to drop the term club team and graduate to varsity at Columbus. They'd be the first true ice hockey team south of the Dade Broward line. It's going to mean a lot because like, my whole life I've been getting ready to play a high school sport. But unlike baseball and unlike football, like I don't have that opportunity. Especially down here in Florida where it's not as accessible to many people to play hockey. Mm -hmm. It could help other people want to join the sport, you know. For the parents, they want to see their kids compete and get recognized like other sports. Some of the kids really have the desire to play. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing in Miami-Dade County per se right now. It's very limited and we have to come to Broward no matter what. Some of the guys on this team grew up playing in the Panthers Development League making a costly commitment to drive north, sometimes three to four times a week. It's so about an hour, an hour and a half drive. Yeah. Every time, each way. <laughs> I always thought that I would like them to play for their alma mater. And um, hockey was never a sport in none of the high schools in Miami. And you have, want to have that school pride. Even my seventh grader is excited that in the future of his sport, he might be able to play for his alma mater. A move to varsity in the fall could also add to the interest and growth of the game spurred on by the Panthers' recent success. We spoke to Matt Janis, director of amateur hockey for the Florida Panthers. It's out the backing of a school and it's in a singular location where all the kids are coming together. It's just wonderful for the league. It's going to be great success. It's always better success for teams when they have that singular school backing. And it's always a goal to make every every team a pure, pure one school team. But now it's difficult to do, but we're just happy when it happens and just happy to see the continued growth of our league and the sport. Absolutely. It takes a lot of dedication on the part of the kids and their parents for them to play hockey here in South Florida. And thanks to our colleague and proud Columbus grad Mike Cuno for doing that story. Still to come on Miami Life, hop on board the new ride at the Magic Kingdom. We're going to detail why Tiana's Bayou Adventure is so important to Disney. Plus, see how artificial intelligence puts you up close and personal with soccer legend Lionel Messi. We take you inside the immersive Messi experience at Coconut Grove when Miami Life continues. Welcome back. Well, Lionel Messi, of course, has been a huge person of interest in South Florida ever since he joined Inter Miami. The soccer legend is now the subject of what may be the ultimate tribute to his career. It is a multimedia exhibit in Coconut Grove that gives Messi fans a chance to experience what it is like to be an icon. At the Messi experience, kids get a chance to light up a virtual pitch the way the real Lionel Messi lights it up for Inter Miami. This high-tech exhibit is designed to pull them into the world of soccer's unparalleled megastar. Messi! The Messi experience has docked at Regatta Harbor in Coconut Grove and has been a hit since it arrived in April. This 20,000 square foot exhibit is part history lesson and part interactive journey into Messi's life. It is Miami-based Primo Entertainment's first foray into sports exhibits. What better way to go than, than Messi? The Messi experience has nine rooms, taking visitors through different phases of the soccer legend's life. It starts with his childhood in Argentina. Messi was in on the project from the start. And throughout the whole creative process, when we started designing it, he was obviously a part of it, right? It's a story about his life, right? So um, really the, the feedback was always great. We really, I like to say we built it together because um, he had a big hand in it and, and we're all very happy with, with the final result. <laughs> They like the first part where, the, where they, all the Argentina people is celebrating the, the championship. They, um, they really like that. I think that they enjoy it the most. With the help of AI and 3D cameras, guests get to feel like they were there when Messi and his teammates won the World Cup two years ago. 
We had a great time. It's an amazing experience. But it's everything we wanted to be. A messy avatar greets you at the start, and before you know it, you are in a locker room with all of his jerseys. And you're hearing Messi provide a digital pep talk. Stand out. Yeah, we really want to do something above and beyond what people are used to seeing and what have, have been seeing, right? Like I said, we wanted to, for, the, for the public to feel as if they're part of it and living his life as if he lived it and the struggles as well as the, as, the, as the good stuff that happened in his life, right? The kids we saw at the Messi experience really got into the interactive elements and also the training session. What's your favorite part about the experience? Um, kicking the ball to to the goal. Oh, pretty good. It's, it's a nice experience. Uh, my Both of my kids are uh, super fans of Messi, so they enjoyed it very much. Everybody's a super fan of Messi. Miami Life coming right back with this. Help us bring this attraction to life and giving that little love letter to New Orleans. Miami Life heads up the road in South Florida. Find out why Disney's newest attraction offers a taste of the Big Easy and a clean break from a controversial moment in the company's history. Welcome back. Well, we know for lots of families in Miami-Dade and Broward, a trip to Disney World is part of the summer itinerary. There is a new ride to check out, Tiana's Bayou Adventure. It is a celebration of New Orleans culture and Disney's first black princess. It's also a way to erase the memories of a controversial ride. <laughs> The newest attraction at Walt Disney World is making a big splash. Located in Frontierland, Tiana's Bayou Adventure features the first black Disney princess and continues the story from the film The Princess and the Frog. CBS Miami got a chance to check out the new ride, which is actually a redesign of Splash Mountain. While the famous 50-foot drop remains, everything else has been updated into a love letter to New Orleans. As a guest riding into the attraction, you're going to see the different layers, uh, whether that's through the music, the scent, the, the, the artwork, um, the murals that we have in the attraction. They're, they're all a piece of New Orleans that we brought back with us. Disney closed Splash Mountain last year after years of complaints that the ride's theme perpetuated racist stereotypes. It was inspired by the 1946 Disney movie Song of the South, a film so notorious that Disney has never released it on home video in the U.S. This new ride is meant to reflect a modern audience and its sensibilities. Yeah, diversity and inclusion is such an important part of what we do here in Imagineering and as part of the Walt Disney Company. And we wanted to be able to continue to tell uh, new stories to, um, to our next generation of guests. Fans of The Princess and the Frog will see familiar faces as well as Easter eggs hidden throughout. And pay attention at the end for a new song by New Orleans musician P.J. Morton and singer Annika Noni Rose, the voice of Tiana. One of the inspirations for Tiana was the queen of Creole cuisine, legendary New Orleans chef Leah Chase. Under her guidance, Dookie Chase's became one of the first and most famous black-owned fine dining restaurants. In many ways, the new attraction is a tribute to Chase and her family's legacy in the French Quarter. So many people said, oh, it's a dream come true. This is bigger than any dream I ever dreamed. So I like to think that it's a blessing that I never saw coming. And the new attraction, by the way, opens to the public on June 28th. While well, we love getting feedback from the Miami Life audience, our recent episode devoted to the movies had some people interested in weighing in. One viewer lamented how expensive it is to go to the movies now. He says, when it's close to $50 for two people, eh, the theater has lost its magic. Another agreed, writing, going to the movies by itself has lost flavor. It's expensive and a fool's errand. But Steve Dohan commented on our story on Miami's once booming film and TV business, saying the loss of the film credit cannot be overstated. It was and still is stupid. <laughs> Keep sending us your comments and feedback to CBSMiami at CBS.com. That does it for this week's episode of Miami Life. Remember, we'll see you every Thursday for Miami Life at 630 on our streaming platforms and 10 p.m. airing on TV 33. I'm Jim Barry. Thanks for watching. See you next week.